Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome. We're super excited you're here, and we're super excited that you have been here, part of Connect. We're at the last session of the day, and we are just beyond excited to have Adam here to just kind of close up our session uh, before we jump into our final giveaways as we go. Uh, just like normal, if you're here, please jump into the chat, say who you are, where you're from, what you teach. Welcome, Carlos, Brittany, Crystal, Nicole. Uh, we're super excited you're here from Iowa, Pakistan. Wow. Bermuda, all over the world. That is super awesome to see people here from Minnesota. Welcome, fellow Minnesotan here as well. Uh, Florida, North Carolina, Fargo. Fantastic. Excellent, excellent. We'll go ahead and just get jumping in. I am Chris here from the Seesaw team and welcome to Learner Empowerment in the Maker Classroom. This is led by Adam Hill. We are super excited that he is here jumping in all the way from the UK. During our session, we encourage you to take notes, share your insights, be active while learning. Remember, you get points in the leaderboard for being active. In the top right, you'll see the chat. There you can just kind of share your insights, connect with people. Right next to that is the Q&A. Again, you can ask questions of Adam and of myself. We'll do our best to answer those as soon as we get them. Uh, if there is time at the very end, we'll just field them back to Adam and see if he has any amazing insights on questions as well. Handouts can also be found on the right. Adam put his slides in there for you to have and to keep uh, moving forward. If you would like to turn on the CC uh, for the specific sound and for your language, click on that little button in the top right corner. Just choose your language and you're all set. Make sure to stick around to the very end. You can get your PD certificate and our swag gear giveaway is also happening then too. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Adam. All right, thank you, Chris. Really appreciate the uh, kind introduction. And thank you to everyone who's come. I know it's the final session, so I was a little bit worried that everyone would be tired and burnt out by this point. I know it's been two fabulous days of learning, so everyone's brains are hurting at this point. So I really appreciate you coming to this. Um, it's great to see such a, a global community as well. Thank you to everyone who made it. Especially good to see uh, some UK folks here. And um, Brittany as well, I saw you in the chat. You're gonna get a few uh, mentions today. So I'm just going to jump over to my slides. I, I hope you can all see this. Um, so this session is about learner empowerment in the maker classroom. I'm gonna talk about making, I'm gonna talk about STEM. I will define some of these terms, uh, but we're really talking about creativity today. My background is as a primary school teacher or elementary teacher, um, but for many years I've been in international settings. I'm from the UK. I'm now based again in West Yorkshire. Uh, but for nearly 10 years, I worked in Hong Kong and China. I've been working in, in big international schools, um, but I'm now based back in the UK. And instead of working for a school now, I'm an independent educational consultant. So now all of my work is about STEM and creativity and helping schools, helping teachers with technology integration, creativity, and all that good stuff. Uh, please find me on social media. I'd love to connect with you all. Follow me. I'll follow you back on all the platforms, Adam Hill EDU, uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever your platform is, you'll, you'll find me there. You'll find this orange background. And you can visit my website if you're interested as well, adamhillconsulting.com. So here's our session for today. Uh, I hope to finish a little bit early so there'll be time for questions at the end. So please use that. Q&A tab, put your questions in there, and then Chris will gather them all. Uh, but this session, we're going to talk about why making matters, why it's so important to uh, schools, not just kindergartens, not just primary schools, but all educational settings. Um, beyond the fact that it's just fun and enjoyable and engaging, it's so much more, um, it's so much deeper than that. It matters so much more than a lot of teachers realize. Um, how any teacher can set up their classroom for making, how to design lessons and units that are rich in making. And we're going to talk about a maker mindset, and I'll share some routines to develop a maker mindset. And these are intentionally simple enough that you can just go ahead and implement them on Monday. Well, for those of you who are still working, implement them on your first day back. But they are simple to implement, simple for students to follow, but they really do develop students' thinking and that maker mindset. Just want to give a shout out to some of the sessions so far and some of my takeaways that I've had this weekend, uh, because a lot of this uh, overlaps with what I'm going to talk about today. 
especially Adam Welcome's keynote yesterday. I took a lot from that, and you'll see a lot of connections today with that. Brittany's session as well yesterday, uh, Brittany Tarr, about young engineers. If you missed it, definitely catch up once the session goes, uh, once the recording goes up, because that was brilliant. I know she's here as well, so she'll, uh, she'll contribute throughout in the chat, I'm sure. Uh, but these have been my key takeaways so far. Brittany spoke yesterday a lot about the four C's, and I'm going to mention them as well throughout the session. Critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, then grit, the idea of having long-term goals, and even though it's challenging to get to them, persevering um, when things get tough, keeping those goals in mind, being resilient, uh, and working hard towards those goals. Adam spoke a lot yesterday about learning experiences and how students remember experiences. They remember the joy. And I hope that you'll see that in, in lots of my work as well. A lot of presenters yesterday and today spoke about problem solving, tinkering, uh, being authentic, iteration. Uh, I know Brittany spoke a lot about this yesterday. Uh, Brittany also, also mentioned a term that I'd never heard before. And I, I really want to spend more time looking into it and talking to her about it the idea of STEM identity. Uh, I think that was really powerful and it's something I personally want to look into more. Uh, but I just want to start with what Adam mentioned yesterday about a new economy with new jobs, because this leads perfectly into what uh, I'm talking about in my first few slides. Adam spoke about how the world is, is changing, the workplace is changing. Uh, we've seen more change in, the last, in my lifetime than I can possibly imagine throughout history. But that change is going to keep on coming. Um, the, the change that we've seen so far has been so fast, um, but it's just going to get faster. Technology is evolving all the time. Um, things are changing. Jobs are changing. The skills that people are looking for are changing. And so I think that's really important for educators to keep in mind, um, because our job is to prepare our students for this world, You know, not just to survive in it, but to thrive. And so we've got to keep that in mind and we've got to make sure that what we're offering is relevant uh, and as meaningful as possible for our students. Uh, it's not just us that's saying this about the, the new skills, the new economy, the new job. You, there's all kinds of literature on this about the jobs that are most in demand. This is just one report from the World Economic Forum. I'll show you the list in a minute. Um, but the list on the left is the top 10 skills that workplaces and employers are looking for in 2023. And when I show you the list on the right, these are the skills that are not necessarily in the top 10 yet, although some of them are, but the ones that are on the rise uh, and will definitely be, be in that top 10 very soon. Just take a minute to, to read through these. These are the skills that workplaces are looking for. Now, these lists would have looked completely different 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We're really moving towards these more human skills, the soft skills, if you like. I know not everybody loves that term, um, but these skills that are uniquely human. And, and AI can't do this yet, certainly not to the ability that humans can. We're talking about creativity, complex problem solving, having empathy, collaborating, all of these skills are so important now in the workplace. Uh, resilience, grit, it's all in here. So when I think about STEM uh, and why it's so important and why it's so relevant, it's not just because it's really enjoyable and it's a fun way of teaching and learning. It's because STEM learning really is, STEM education is these things. You know, some more than others, some apply more than others. But when I think about the STEM classroom, when I think about STEM learning, this is what children are developing. This is where children are uh improving all the time and these are the skills that they're they're working on so i think stem is more relevant than ever before and it's really our secret source as we're trying to prepare them for such a an unpredictable and complicated world just to make sure we're on the same page when i talk about stem i'm talking about the interdisciplinary application of science technology engineering and maths so these things, are not in isolation, but these subjects, these skills, um, working together to solve real world problems uh, and meaningful projects. 
STEM is all about solving problems um, and really authentic problems in meaningful ways. But a term that I'm going to use uh, probably more today is, is about all about being a maker, a maker-centered learning. So we hear a lot about the maker movement, and I define a maker as someone who is not just someone who has creative ideas, although that's important, but somebody who has the complement, the confidence to implement those ideas. So it's not just about having the ability to be creative, but having the confidence to put those ideas into place, because makers are empowered to solve problems and bring about meaningful change. And I think that's really the theme of my whole presentation is that empowerment piece. It's going to be so important for students and, and their lives moving forward. This is a quote from the book, uh, Maker-Centered Learning, Empowering Young People to Shape Their Worlds. So one of the primary outcomes of maker-centered learning mentioned throughout the study and talked about with passion had to do with helping young people develop an I can do attitude. So this is really closely related to making and creativity, that empowerment piece, and that, that feeling of I, I can do this, I can bring about a change, I can solve this problem, uh, and I can help. And so often our children are, are accused of being helpless and entitled and, um, and not independent, and making really helps them to develop in those areas. I just want to tell a very short story, if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, because I think it perfectly highlights this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was working in a school in, in Hong Kong at that time, and it was the last day of school before uh, the Easter holidays. And because it was the last day before a, a decent holiday, um, we were told by our admin to, to dress up, show some effort, something connected to Easter. We'll have the whole school dress up in some kind of Easter theme, um, so we had bunnies and eggs and chickens. You can imagine the whole scene. And every class would have a class photo with all of these accessories and costumes. And I, I, I don't really like that kind of thing. I get into it. But on this occasion, I completely forgot. And my class started turning up in all of these wonderful costumes. And, and the first two girls who arrived in, in their, their costumes, I just apologized to them. I said, I, I completely forgot. I don't have anything. Um, I'll, I'll see what I can find, I'll see if I can borrow something, um, but I just completely forgot, and I'm sorry. And these students said, like it was the most obvious thing in the world, let's just make something for you. And they were the first students to arrive in the morning, they had a bit of time before the assembly, and 10 minutes later, they gave me this. So really cute, they made me these bunny ears. Um, it, like I say, it took them about 10 minutes to make it, but it's that, that mindset of that we have a problem here, we can solve it. We know how to solve it. We've got the materials available to us. We've got the confidence. We've had to play around with these things before, and we're confident that we can solve this problem. Now, of course, the, the bunny ears are not going to change the world, uh, but I think that that mindset really will, that, that feeling of empowerment and being, being able to solve problems um, and, and not relying on other people to solve problems all the time. And I think this, this is twofold, really, why I share this story. One is because they've developed that mindset through all the projects that we've done. But the other thing they had was easy and accessible um, materials, materials that they had available in the classroom already that they could just grab and make something with. And I know Brittany, again, spoke about this yesterday, about how you don't need the most expensive, fancy tech gadgets you know, it's great if you've got the money for that and you've got robotics and, and all these other things. But really what you need is just the cheapest, most reusable, uh, recyclable, scrappy materials. That's what every classroom needs, in my opinion. So just a few examples of what that could look like. These are the most powerful materials in any STEM classroom. They're cheap and they're reusable. Um, cardboard, th there's no better STEM resource than cardboard, in my opinion, especially the kind of thin cardboard Cardboard that's easy for students to work with. But just gather your popsicle sticks, your pipe cleaners. I do a lot of work with clips, paper clips and bulldog clips, just so we can take things apart easily and reuse them. And I can really uh, emphasize that sustainability piece as well. Uh, paper cups, drawers, just scrappy materials that are probably in your school anyway. 
grab them, organize them in your classroom so that students have easy access to these materials. Lego is a bit more of an investment, Play-Doh, things like that, relatively cheap, but more of an investment than other things. But again, your school might already have them. Uh, at the bottom as well, I'll put their scrappy circuits. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, there's a, a book to go along with it. There's some YouTube videos, really easy to follow. And it's how you can make electrical components using um, scrappy recyclable materials really, really cheaply. So even in this kind of environment, without investing a lot, you can add electrical components and elevate your maker projects. So this for me is, is the most important. Uh, these are the most important resources in a, in a maker classroom uh, that don't require a massive investment. Now, if you do have money to invest, that's amazing. Uh, and you can really elevate the making and, and add, uh, you know, take it to that next level. Uh, but I think the important thing here is that products and investments should be as versatile as possible. So making sure that you're investing in resources that can be used throughout the year uh, in many different projects across the curriculum. You know, so often I, I see teachers buying things like um, create your own sundial and create your own alarm clock using potatoes, things like that, where you follow the instructions, you make it, and then it's done. Uh, whereas and even though those things can be fun and that they do have value, but materials and resources that you can use throughout the year and across the curriculum are so, are so much better as an investment. So here are just a, a few suggestions. I've got thousands of others. Um, don't really have time to go into all of these, but you'll recognize some of them, I'm sure. But different robotics, different construction kits, microcontrollers for programming. Uh, some of these are more expensive than others. Uh, but these are just a, a few recommendations. If we've got time at the end, I might be able to dive more into these. And then uh, Adam Welcome mentioned in his keynote yesterday about how schools, every corner of a school should be rich in, in literature, in books, in novels, picture books. Uh, and this applies to STEM as well and, and any kind of maker classroom. There are so many amazing picture books and novels that apply to STEM. But just a reminder, if you are setting up your space at school, that every classroom should be a maker space. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have an issue with, um, you know, purpose-built purpose or dedicated maker spaces. I think those can be fantastic. But if the children only go to them once a month or, or even once a week, you're missing opportunities for making. And I think every classroom, your classroom, where the children spend most of their time should be, um, rich in making and materials. Students need access to craft and construction materials wherever they are. Make it easy, make it accessible. If you really don't have space in your classroom and space is a real issue in your school, you can even put everything in a trolley that can be easily moved around and still easily accessed. I'll show you a photo of what that might look like on, on the next slide. I'm always emphasizing that sustainability piece by reusing materials. I don't use a lot of like glue or plastic tape, but just again, for that reason, um, we're trying to be more environmentally friendly. So again, just always encouraging students to use pegs and clips, things that can easily be removed and reused. And as mentioned, there are so many books that you can use um, to bring literature in and reading in and promote making at the same time. Here are just a couple of examples of what it could look like if you need uh, materials and resources to be more mobile instead of having one place in the classroom. Um, so in both of these pictures, these are on wheels. Um, the, the one on the left there, the, the trays can be easily removed as well. So even if you, you don't need the whole trolley, grab a couple of the trays, take them into your room. I really like the, the setup on the right with the um, little trays there that are open, visible, easily accessible. Again, those little trays can be removed if you don't need the whole thing. Uh, but still, even if you haven't got them in your room, just making sure students have that easy access to resources so that making can be spontaneous and, and happen anytime in authentic opportunities. Chris, just before I go any further, I'm just conscious of talking really fast. Are there any burning questions at this point? 
There, yeah, I'll, I'll just field you a couple questions here, Adam. Um, there was a lot of questions around the books and like you, yeah. you showed a quick picture of the books. Do you happen to have like a, a list or somewhere that you might uh, point people to that they can go through and see what kind of books that they could add to their libraries? Uh, do, do you mean the, the picture books? That yeah, books? yep. I, I don't have a list anywhere, but the you can see the slides as, as Chris mentioned before in the handouts. Uh, so you can at least see that picture of, of some of my favorite picture books. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I'll make sure to, uh, I'll reshare that in the handouts. Uh, you can go through again, look through his slides. If you need to zoom in a little bit, that that's a PDF. So you'll also be able to look at that as well. But yeah, I'll let you keep on going, Adam. We got a couple more questions, but we'll address those at the very, very end. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, there's a, a, some really solid teacher books in this as well. I've, I've mentioned a little bit so far. I'll keep mentioning them, but I've got some really solid teacher recommendation, uh, professional development books. Okay, I'll jump back into the slides. So now we're thinking about um, lesson design or unit design and, and how you could really approach that with making in mind. I just want to start with the picture on the right because that's the simplest. This is from the book Invent to Learn, uh, which is one of my favorite books on STEM education and the maker movement. Definitely a recommendation. Um, actually, don't go for the blue book. That's the first edition. There's a purple one that's the second edition. Um, but I really love this picture because it's so simple. Um, not every creative um, opportunity needs to be a long, in-depth process. Making is so much more um, spontaneous and quick quite often. Uh, but I love how this little robot guy is emphasizing a few really key steps that are often overlooked. So don't just dive into the making. Sometimes that's appropriate, but really encouraging children to think about what they're making. Think about what they're doing. Be very intentional about those choices, what materials they should use. Think about what they need to research first, who they need to collaborate with, what it might look like, so what some of the problems might be, and then moving on to the making. And then even more important than that, and, and so much more overlooked, is the improvement part. And this, for me, is where the magic happens. This is where learning is, is the, the most powerful, the deepest learning is when students are iterating and um, trying to improve their products and their creations. But it's so often overlooked because teachers are lacking time or because students have made something they're really proud of. They snap a picture and post it on Seesaw and then everybody moves on. Um, but really that improvement is, is key. And I like how this robot has two legs because there's two ways to improve a creation. It might be finding the things that are wrong and fixing them. But even if everything is good and everything's fine and everything works, you can still find ways to make it even better. So I, I just love how simple this robot is, but includes some really important reminders about um, think, make and improve. But moving on to the design thinking process. And again, I know other people mentioned this in, in other presentations. And I know Brittany mentioned yesterday that there are 500 versions of this process. You know, this is just one of them. Um, they might call it the design thinking process, the uh, engineering process. They might use slightly different words, but typically they're all generally the same ideas. Uh, but I think this is really powerful for planning uh, a series of lessons or a unit. For those of you who are teaching inquiry settings, uh, this for me is the most authentic process for student-led inquiry. And the most important thing with this, again, people have mentioned it already, but it's not designed to be linear. You don't start at step one and then go on to step two. In fact, I wrote down how Brittany said it yesterday, engineers jump all over the place. Engineers jump all over the place. So it's not just step one and step two, or maybe back to step one, it's wherever they need to go. But at some point during the creative process, they're gonna visit these different areas. Uh, and I really love these words. This is, this is my favorite to use personally just because of that em emphasis on empathizing. And again, that's one of the key skills that employers are looking for right now, that ability to empathize with other people. So it's not just designing something that's cool for yourself, but finding problems that other people are facing and working in partnership with those users um, to help them, to really understand their needs, their wants, um, things that we need to consider and how to improve other people's lives. I think that empathy piece is really, um, really powerful. And then defining, because so often, it, even 
um, not just in schools, but in, in other design contexts. Designers too often spend a lot of time and a lot of money developing amazing solutions to the wrong problems. So it's important to really define at some point in the process what the problem is. What are we actually trying to achieve? This defining phase is about organizing all of those insights, organizing the research, and getting down to the root problem. What is this really about? What's the heart of the issue? So that you can then move on to ideation. And ideation, again, I like this phase. I like that word because often students will have an idea and they'll run with their first idea. But ideation is about encouraging um, even more creation, even more ideas, collaborating with other people. Um, because so often our first idea is not the best one. Perhaps it's the most obvious one. Um, it's not, not always the most creative. So when we encourage students to think of many possible solutions, uh, it just takes their thinking and their ideas to a whole other level. Then prototyping. So it, again, it's important to emphasize here that we're not developing the final solution. We're not gonna spend weeks on this. It's just a quick representation of our idea um, because we fully expect it not to be perfect. We expect to keep iterating. We expect to get feedback on that and, and, and fix things and improve it. And then being able to test our product, taking it back to those users, getting that all important feedback, checking if everything works, and then just jumping back to whatever phase of the process you need to go through to improve and get closer and closer towards that final solution. So of course that takes a lot of time uh, to do that process properly and in depth. And it's, it's really important you don't run out of time because like I said, for me, the magic happens towards the end of that process when, when students are iterating and, and fixing the problems and uh, making things even better, responding to feedback. But I think that for me is a really powerful um, framework for designing units that can apply to so many different areas of the curriculum. So the reason I share both of those is because sometimes we, we want really in-depth processes and, and really in-depth um, frameworks, but so often as well, making is just spontaneous and we just wanna dive into it. And that's good as well. Both of these have a place in the classroom. So these are just two that I personally refer to quite often. Here are just a few photos from my class of, of what this looks like. Again, I'm, I, my background is in primary education. I'm a general teacher, teach you know across the curriculum, teach all the subjects. Um, I did have a couple of years as a, a tech specialist and an innovation coach, but these are just primary classrooms and primary lessons in social studies and geography and um, all those standards that the elementary teachers have to cover. So this is not a special class, this is a, a primary class. So for me, it's about looking at the units and looking at the standards and trying to find authentic opportunities for making and thinking about at what point is making going to elevate the learning, take it to another level. So three questions that I often ask myself when I'm planning lessons and planning units, what might my students make to deepen their understanding? What might students make to express their understanding? And what might students make to apply their understanding? And this is when I get my ideas for lessons and creative opportunities and, and real authentic opportunities to integrate STEM. Like I said, all of these um, ideas are, are where STEM is being integrated into the rest of the curriculum. These are not standalone STEM classes. So now just going back to that empowerment piece about um, maker empowerment. Uh, this agency by design is part of that book, um, Maker-Centered Learning, that I mentioned before. And these are the ways that they recommend developing that maker empowerment. And they say it's about developing students' sensitivity to design. In other words, their awareness of the human-made designs that are all around them. Because we tend to just uh, take things for granted and not really notice them. But if we can develop that sensitivity, then students feel that sense of empowerment as well. And there are three parts to this, to developing students' awareness of design. One is constantly giving them opportunities to look closely at human-made designs. Another is exploring the complexity. So how do things work or how are they complex? Even if you don't fully understand how they work, what are the things that you don't know? How are, the, how are all these different parts working together? 
And then that finding opportunity piece, again, coming back to that I can do attitude, how would you improve it? How would you make it even better? So if we focus on these three things continually throughout the year, throughout their school life, they're constantly developing their sensitivity to design and becoming more empowered as a maker and as a problem solver. So a lot of people are familiar with thinking routines already. Um, just in case you're not, they're a set of protocols, you might say, a set of prompts to encourage students thinking at a deeper level and make sure students are, are really, um, yeah, ju just thinking at that deeper level that so often is, is missing from classrooms because of a, a lack of time or a focus on other things. These are a set of prompts that will encourage students to just take their thinking to that whole other level. Um, but some of the famous ones are the, the core thinking routines that you can see on the top left here. So if you're familiar with the thinking routines from Project Zero, the core thinking routines are things like um, See, Think, Wonder, the Chalk Talk, Think, Puzzle, Explore. The, but the, some of these other ones are, are much lesser known. And there's a whole section of thinking routines from Project Zero that are about investigating objects and systems. And like I said, these are not, not particularly well known, but if we can establish these routines in our classrooms, um, then we're constantly developing the students' sensitivity to design. And these thinking routines, all of them are across these different categories are designed to be as simple as possible. They're powerful, but they're simple. So it's ve they're very easy to implement. And after you've done them a couple of times, again, they are called routines. So the idea is you use them again and again and again across the curriculum and students become really familiar with the type of thinking required to respond to them. So I'm just going to show you three examples of the routines from the objects and systems category. So this one is called design hunt. So there are just four simple prompts here. So uh, this could work in two ways. You could send students off on a hunt to find particular objects. So for example, if you're um, learning about materials, you might send them on a hunt to find different objects that are made out of wood. Or it could just be a general design hunt. Look for things that are interesting. So here are the four prompts here, starting quite simple. After they've found something um, or, or chosen something to focus on, what is the object or system? And it's important here, not just physical objects. It could be a system, that, some kind of routine within the school or within the environment. Question two, what do you notice about it? What's interesting about it? Then going deeper still, what do you think the designers thought about when creating this object or system? So really trying to think as designers, empathizing with the designers. What were they trying to achieve? What problems were they trying to solve? Who were they trying to help? And then that really powerful piece about finding opportunities. What are some ways that you might redesign the object or system? So just four really simple questions, but powerful questions that students can think about when they're hunting for human made designs. You don't have to do that on Seesaw, but I do have a, a design hunt template if you're interested. Again, these slides are available, available in the handouts tab. So if you're interested, you can grab my my template and do this on Seesaw. But just a, a few examples here of what my students have done and, and things they've noticed around school. Because when you send students on a design hunt, they notice things that they wouldn't normally notice. The designs, interesting designs are all around them and they don't really pay attention to them. Uh, but when they start looking, they're intentional about finding them. This next routine is called Parts, Purposes, Complexities. You might use simpler words with, student, with uh, younger students, um, but this is all about think, looking closely and thinking about how objects work. Now, in this picture, you can see the students have actually broken an object apart because I think that adds value to this, but you don't have to do that if it's, if it's not appropriate for, for the lesson. Um, but again, these questions get deeper and more complex as we go through. So first of all, what are the parts? Just simply labeling them. What are the purposes of each of those parts? And then how is it complicated in the way that those parts work together? 
So I think this is a great routine for just thinking about all of the objects around them and the materials and thinking about how they work. These are just a few ways that I've done that in class. Um, sometimes using seesaw and text, sometimes on paper, but just thinking about the parts, the purposes and the complexities. Uh, this is a great routine. This is probably the simplest one, but again, really, really powerful thinking about how you could improve designs. And this could be existing designs like this boy's doing here, thinking about ways that he could improve that, um, that food cart, or it could be a way, this routine could be applied to their own designs and their own creations, thinking about how they can improve their own work. But just four questions here to think about ways that they can improve the design. In what ways could it be more effective? So work better. In what ways could it be more efficient? So work faster or easier. In what ways could it be more ethical? So just thinking about the, the fairness and, and making sure that everything's done in a good and proper way. And then finally, the way it looks is important, might not be the most important factor, um, but in what ways could it be more beautiful? And I think it's important to um, ask all four of these questions so that they don't just focus on, uh, on one of them. Because often students will just focus on what it looks like. Um, especially if it already seems to work, whatever they've created or whatever they're thinking about. Uh, but even if it works, it could work better, it could work more efficiently, and the whole thing could be more ethical. So I think these are four really useful prompts as well. There's a link there to a Seesaw template if you wanted to do this within Seesaw. Again, you don't have to, but there's a template there if you're interested, the link. Um, and that's the picture there of the student work is when the student was using this routine to improve her own product and her own design. I was going to give everyone a, a try with this and, and to go to the Padlet and upload your own photos and upload your own responses. Um, but just to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions, I'm, I'm just going to move on from this. Uh, but if you are interested in these routines, just reach out to me anytime and I can explain them in, in greater depth or I can um, offer more examples if that would be useful. But with any of the thinking routines, um, the, the design ones or any of the core ones or any of the other categories, it's important that you think about the teacher's role when we apply these thinking routines to our lessons. And we, because teachers can often get in the way of the thinking or do the thinking for the students or guide them towards the, the answer that they want. So it's really important to think about what the teacher should be doing to, to scaffold their thinking and facilitate their thinking rather than just getting in the way. So these are three really important roles that the teacher can have. Really think about what you should be listening for, how you might document it, and the questions that you should be asking to take their, their learning and their thinking to a deeper level. That's from the book, The Power of Making Thinking Visible. So I, I just wanted to end on a few um, key points, a few misconceptions that I hear quite often when it comes to STEM and making. Um, so making is not just for older students. It's not just for younger students. I know those first two seem to contradict each other, um, but I hear both of them so often, like as, as if they need to be a certain age before they can do this properly, or you know the opposite end of the schooling, you know, play and, and tinkering and making is so, associated with kindergarten and younger students so often, but it can play a role throughout school and it should play a role throughout school. It has so many benefits to all learners, um, not just any particular age. It's not just something to give to gifted students. Again, I don't love that term, um, but it's not just a way for high ability students to apply their learning or take it further. It's a way for all students to do that. Making in STEM is not necessarily lots of technology or screen time. Um, quite intentionally not included much technology in this presentation because quite often there isn't. Um, don't get me wrong, I think it, it plays a really important role and it can offer a lot to, to STEM education. And a lot of my work is, is rich in technology, but it doesn't have to be and it isn't always. And making is not something to add if you have time because if we, we never have time, do we? We have to be more intentional than that. Uh, it's not a very different approach to teaching and learning. You know, the things I'm suggesting today are not, not necessarily new or, or groundbreaking, 
it, you'll recognize a lot of this in your own practice already. It's just being about more, in, about being, again, more intentional about it and making more time for it. And for anyone who teaches online for whatever reason, it's not impossible to facilitate making in STEM online. It might be a little bit harder, um, but of course it's possible. So if there's one thing I want you to leave you with, it's a quote from that book, Invent to Learn. Making, tinkering, tinkering and engineering should be visible in every classroom, regardless of the subject or age of the students. That's my key message for you to take away. Um, whatever you teach, whoever you teach, let's bring making, tinkering and engineering uh, into the class. So uh, thanks everyone for listening. I'll spend the rest of the time answering questions. Please reach out to me if you want to speak directly to me. I'll put my social media handle there, my email, my website. If you're interested in my work, you can join my email list following that link. Um, so many different ways to connect with me. I'd love to connect with you too and, and keep these conversations going. Amazing, amazing. Adam, thank you so much for sharing such a great presentation and such insightful resources too for us to use and take away. Um, I'm going to give you a couple questions that kind of came up and I'm going to paraphrase and summarize a few of them into some single questions here. Um, I'll start with an easy one. What yeah. advice would you give to a teacher who wants to start a makerspace but doesn't have one yet? What advice would you give them to get started? Uh, I, I guess what, what they mean by the if they don't have a... Do, in that question, do they mean there's no space in the school that's been... Yeah, maybe they want one in their classroom. What, what advice would you give them to be able to carve their own space in their school or their classroom? Exactly. I would just start in your classroom, start by, um, you know, having those conversations with colleagues, but just model it in your own classroom first. Get it going in your own classroom. Start with the cheap materials. They're the best ones anyway. Um, gather materials from home. Gather materials from the rest of the school. Steal stuff from the art room but just uh, make sure those materials are available in your own classroom and the students have easy access to them. And, and then of course, get using them. Absolutely. And then it'll grow from that, from those conversations you have with colleagues. Absolutely. And then you'll eventually have one in your whole school. Absolutely. Um, I'll jump into the next one here, thinking about safety and, and young learners, like what kind of things do you make sure you put into place as far as safety rules? Is there just kind of a basic set that you have that, you know, somebody who's new to makerspaces can take and immediately use in their space? Uh, I think it's a really good question, an important question. Um, and of course, there are things that need to be mentioned. And I, I guess teachers who teach younger students might have better answers to this so please if you've got ideas put them in the chat because um, a lot of my experience is with kind of upper elementary um, so i don't have a lot of experience with like the youngest students but i think it's just about common sense and bringing in these lessons whenever it's authentic um, just little things like how to use a, a glue gun in a safe way you don't need to spend half an hour on that um, but it's just constantly reminding them of the little things and and, and being being very active as a teacher, walking around the room as well and making sure people are being safe and making sure students are holding each other accountable for safety. Um, but I wouldn't say I spend hours and hours talking about safety, just bringing those lessons whenever I need to and, and keep reminding them. Absolutely. Love it. And a lot of the resources, too, and the tools that you use are also not inherently dangerous. You know, we right. know paper clips are not also uh, the most dangerous things in the world. So I think it's also what you're using too that exactly. could just help exactly. to keep it more safe. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to put this one in front of everybody. I'm going to pull this one up so that we can all read this one together. Because I think this is a really important question mm -hmm. we'll close in on here is how do you involve parents in this uh, beyond just the, the academics in this mindset around what you're doing and why you're doing it? Could you just share a little bit about this? Yeah, I think um, any parents will, if, if you can give them similar experiences, uh, like we spent a lot, lot of time uh, in my previous school doing parent workshops, um, doing activities together with parents and children, special days, special events, just involving parents at every time, uh, every opportunity. And they, through those experiences, they realize how powerful it is. And they realize that, um, that they're so engaged and what they're learning is so important. And I think it's just about constantly communicating with parents about what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, what we believe, what our philosophy is as educators and as, as a school, um, what our mission is. And, and it's, if everyone's aligned on all of those elements, then, then parents are on board as well. 
Um, so just keeping them involved as much as possible. And of course, Seesaw really helps with that. Absolutely. I love that. Love that mindset and love having everybody be a part of that learning, just like we have in yeah. the learning loop here. I'm looking at some of these comments and they're amazing. Thank you, everyone, for your right. engagement. Yes, we so appreciate your time here, Adam. Uh, I am going to close up our session. There was uh, such amazing insights shared in the chat, too. So please feel free to scroll, scroll through that and grab a yeah. couple links if you want to. Yeah. Um, just so everybody knows, your PD certificate will be emailed to you and the session recording for all of our Connect sessions. Those will be available starting around August 4th. So give us a couple days and day and a half here to kind of close up the conference. And then we'll make sure everything gets turned on for on demand so you can come back and watch things over and over again. Um, if you do have time in the next 15 minutes before our final closing sessions, you can visit the networking tab, connect with anybody for your last chance uh, to just kind of share some inspiration with them. We're going to do our giveaway here right now with me clicking our spinner and seeing who our final winners are for our Connect conference. Spin, spin with no whammies here. There we go. Congratulations to our two winners. We will be emailing you uh, with some next steps and just making sure that um, we have everything and all the details we need to get you your swag packs. Uh, there is going to be a one question survey following this up. This just helps us to make a better conference for next year and every year moving forward. We so appreciate you being here, educators, and investing in Seesaw with your professional development. Special thank you to Adam for being here and giving us such amazing instructional insights around making. We appreciate it. We're going to go. Yes. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining. Thank you. My pleasure.